All right, we're just about ready to get started with our next session. Patrick here is going to bring the chill vibes instead of the music. How's it going, Patrick? <laughs> Doing great. How are you, Skyler? Great, great. Having a great day hosting this uh, conference on track three. Had a lot of great talks so far and super excited for this next one. Uh, so I'll just kind of like kick it off with a quick intro and let you take it away. But Patrick is here, a uh, staff engineer from the Vertex Applied AI Incubator at Google. And I think the big thing you should know about Patrick is he just published a uh, white paper on agents with some collaborators, uh, kind of leveraging his wealth of experience working on conversational AI for a long time. And so you should definitely go check that out. It just dropped on Kaggle. So that's definitely a way to kind of read up more on these ideas. But uh, without further ado, let's just jump into it. Let's take it away. Cool. Thanks, Skylar. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for having me today. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's been a really cool conference so far. I've been watching a lot of the talks. They're all really great. Got to meet some llamas. I thought Dalai Lama is the like best name for a llama ever. It's really great. Um, you know, it's funny when Demetrius first asked me to you know do this presentation. Uh, I was going to put together something around you know agents with Gemini things like that. Uh, I started noticing that everyone was kind of doing like how to build an agent. So I made a slight pivot, and so I'd like you to kind of you know accompany me on this pivot journey today. Really, what I'm going to talk about today is lessons learned over the last couple of years of delivering generative AI agents and kind of just being in the trenches. Um, so uh, getting started, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Patrick Marlowe, staff engineer at Vertex Applied AI Incubator at Google. It's a mouthful of what does that mean? Um, you know, me and my team, we work on a lot of sort of just the cutting edge stuff when it comes to large language models, function calling, the Gemini SDKs, things like that. Uh, I have been in the conversational AI and NLP space for a little over 12 years. Um, right now, my focus is working on multi-agent architectures, kind of memory usage in agents, uh, understanding how agents use these things efficiently. Um, as Skylar just mentioned, I dropped a white paper this morning. I was a co-author. It was really, really cool uh, to be a part of that. So if you're interested in agents, obviously you are, you're here, uh, go check out that white paper. Uh, I'm also a large contributor to the open source community. So I manage a couple of open source repos at Google, uh, contributor to LangChain as well. Uh, so really, you know, kind of enjoy that part of, uh, of large language models and the agent community and stuff. It's really great. Um, okay, so let's get started. I'm gonna do a super brief history of uh, large language model applications. Uh, and then we'll get into the lessons learned. So in the very early days when we first started, you know, kind of this whole Gen AI journey, there was basically just models, right? So as a user, you would send a query into that model, that model would magically respond with a bunch of amazing tokens and you would look at the answers and you'd say, hey, these are really great. Uh, but one of the things that we noticed very quickly is that there is this concept of hallucinations, uh, didn't always get things right or it was confidently wrong. Uh, and so very quickly, we kind of moved on from this architecture of just models into this concept of retrieval augmented generation or RAG. Um, so I would say like 2023 was definitely the year of RAG. That's when everyone was, you know, kind of implementing RAG solutions. Um, this also brought the rise of a ton of amazing companies in the vector DB space, right? So now we had vector databases where we could do, you know, embeddings of all different types of data that we wanted to store. And now when we send those queries in, the model can actually ground itself uh, with external knowledge from these vector databases. We had less hallucinations, um, but still it was kind of like a you could think of this as like a single shot architecture. There was a query in, there was a retrieval, there was some generation and we're done, right, the end. Um, but what we were really lacking is the ability to add uh, kind of like another level of orchestration around that. And that's really where we get the idea of agents. So, you know, agents, you know, kind of came about, you know, late 23 into early 24, uh, or at least kind of into the mainstream, I should say. Um, and we start to see this concept of like reasoning with agents and orchestration with agents and, you know, kind of really being able to do kind of multi-turn inference and stuff like that that's happening under the hood. You know, you've got tools that they have access to, uh, access to, sometimes multiple models that they have access to, things like that. So the concept of agents that we're going to be talking about, you know, delivering in production today is, is kind of this architecture. And there's lots of variations on this architecture, but roughly, you know, this is what we talk about when we, we talk about agents in production. So... 
getting to production, um, the first thing that I'd like to point out is that production is not just a simple model. I think over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of hyper focus on, you know, what LLM are you using? You know, are you using 01? Are you using 3.5 Turbo? Are you using 4? Are you using Gemini Pro or Flash? There's a lot of hyper focus on that model. But the reality of the situation is that your production agents are more than just the model. In fact, there's a lot that goes into it, right? That's whether it's you're taking that model and you're adding grounding to it or you're adding tuning or all the prompt engineering that goes around that. Uh, and then you really start to see that there's like more and more that gets layered into this. And you start to realize that there's this entire kind of system design practice that goes into building out an agent, including orchestration, API integrations, you know, CICD, analytics. There's, there's so much that really goes into it. And so you realize that, you know, an agent, again, not just a model anymore, but you're really starting to think about like your software development lifecycle best practices, how you do system design, how you put everything together. Um, and if I'm predicting the future here, I would say that at some point, you know, a lot of the models that we're looking at, they're all going to become commoditized. They're all going to be fast. They're all going to be good. They're all going to be cheap. And so really what you're left with is that ecosystem that you're building around your model to make things like truly good. And that's kind of where, you know, your secret sauce comes into play uh, for building your, your models and putting them out in, or your agents and putting them out in production. So today I'm going to touch on just a couple of, or a few of these things uh, and really just kind of summarize it into, into these three points. I'm going I'm to touch on this concept called meta prompting. Um, touch a little bit on safety and guardrails and then finish up with evaluations. And so really uh, after delivering hundreds of models into production with lots of different developers and customers and partners, like these are the same three consistent themes that we saw across everyone that was doing really, really high quality agents in production. And so I wanna share all that information with you today. Uh, so first we'll start with meta prompting. So the TLDR around meta prompting is essentially you're using AI to build AI. Now a meta prompting system, um, you know, kind of the whole architecture starts simply like this. You have some sort of meta prompting system that, you know, we'll talk about in a little bit more detail here in a second. And that meta prompting system is going to generate some uh, prompts for a secondary system. So we'll call that the target agent system. This is the agent you're gonna put out into production. That agent will then produce, you know, some sort of responses, which you can then evaluate and you can, send those evaluations back into your meta prompt system. So you go around the circle as many times as you want to sort of optimize the types of prompts that you would be sending or using in your target agent system. So to give you a little bit of intuition around how something like that, like that might look in production, here is a handcrafted prompt that I wrote, right? So I'm saying like, hey, you're a Google Caliber software engineer. You've got exceptional expertise in data structures and algorithms. Here's the things that you can do. You know, you can solve coding problems. You can debug code. You can write doc strings and perform reviews and so on and so forth. Typical type of prompt that we might see in production or that, that someone might write from prompt engineering perspective. But the thing is, is when we actually feed this to like a meta prompting system, what we're asking the LLM to do for us is say, like, take this prompt and write it in higher fidelity, you know, sort of embellish on all of this and add more descriptions to this so that a secondary LLM system will be able to use it uh, with much more accuracy. So after passing that through uh, an LLM you know, optimizer, this kind of meta prompting technique, you get something like this. Now, semantically, it's pretty much the same as the, pre the previous prompt that you saw, but the difference is sort of like how it gets structured, the language that gets used. And again, the way I like to think about it is that, you know, humans aren't always necessarily great at explaining themselves. And so what you're doing here is you're leveraging the LLM's capability to kind of write and, and embellish, not necessarily embellish, I should say, but like just describe in higher fidelity and more detail the tasks that you want completed. And so there's a, there's a big difference putting something like this into production versus putting the small snippet of what I was just showing previously into production. So to kind of show you a little bit how that architecture could come into play, um, we'll talk about one of the first concepts for doing meta prompting, which is called seeding. So the way that this works is essentially you would start with your meta prompt system and you would start with some sort of system prompt. That system prompt might look something like this, right? Hey, you're an expert at building virtual agent assistants. You're going to help this user basically write prompts for this virtual agent assistant system, right? Then you, the developer, would write what we'll call the seed prompt. 
Now the seed prompt is essentially the same type of prompt that you saw me write previously in the handwritten prompt section, but I'm going to give a little bit more information. I'm going to say, hey, you know, the, the end users company that you're writing this prompt for, it's Google Cloud, they're a software engineer, and then here's the task that we want to have accomplished. And then what happens is that meta prompt system will generate these target agent prompts. Now you can go around this loop as many times as you want, refining that prompt and, and you know, in any way that you want and kind of modifying it. But when you're satisfied with the prompts that have been generated, you then drop those into your target agent system. So this is a really great way, you know, if you're building an agent for the first time and you're not super great at prompt engineering and you're like, hey, I'm not a great creative writer, but I need something high fidelity to really start my first agent off. It's a super great system to use um, to kind of kick off your, your you know, agent prompt for the first time. Now, the second way that we can use meta prompting is in the concept of, of optimization, right? And so the way optimization works is just taking this system a little bit step further, right? So once we put our agent into production, our agent's going to start producing responses. And we can take those responses and we can evaluate them against different types of metrics. I think lots of other speakers today have talked about evals and things like that. So imagine evaluating your responses against, you know, coherence and fluency and semantic similarity, things like that. And essentially what you do is you then take those evaluations and you send them back to your meta prompt system and you say, hey, given this existing prompt that I have and here's some set of evaluation data points that we now have, can you optimize my prompt for better coherence? Can you optimize my prompt to reduce the losses in my tool calling? Right. And then what this meta prompt system will do is, again, just kind of go around that cycle and write better prompts to kind of optimize for the metrics that you want to optimize for. Now, uh, you might be looking at the system and you might you know, be feeling a little bit like this <laughs> exhibit meme him where it's just like, you know, we're writing prompts to write prompts, to produce prompts, to do all kinds of prompts. And like, I totally feel you on it. The cool thing is there's a lot of really great uh, systems out there that you can use uh, to do this type of prompt optimization. Now, if you're following along, take a screenshot here, capture this with your phone. This is going to take you over to a YouTube video where it's a, a, little, a bit more lengthy to kind of talk about how you can do this meta prompting with, with Gemini, with OpenAI, with, with Claude, with, with all the different systems. Um, if you're also familiar, there's some really great open source systems out there like DSpy, uh, Adelflow, um, Vertex Prompt Optimizer from, from Google. There's a lot of really great stuff out there that you can do use for prompt optimization. So it's a little bit about meta prompting. Uh, we're going to move on to the next one. So uh, the next one we're going to talk about is safety. Uh, and I think for a lot of users putting uh, their agents into production, their architecture might look something like this, right? Especially if you're putting an agent into sort of like an internal use case production, you're thinking, hey, my users, they're all super friendly. I'm going to give them a UI. I'm going to put a little bit of prompt engineering as my quote unquote defense layer against my agent so they don't do anything dumb. Uh, and then I'm basically going to let this cycle repeat, right? But the reality is if you put those agents out into the wild, so like you actually let them go into the, the public domain, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of bad actors out there, right? Uh, and so those bad actors are gonna be looking to, to break your agent. They're gonna be looking to do prompt engineering. They're gonna try to figure out a prompt injection. They're gonna try to figure out ways to you know, kind of game your system that you've built. And so it's important to kind of think about that ahead of time and start implementing multi-layered defenses against these types of uh, things. And it's not always prompt injection, right? So where this really starts is, um, you know, kind of thinking about input filters, right? So when a user query is actually coming into the system, you know, you can do things like language classification checks or category checks or session limit checks and things like that. So, you know, for example, there's a lot of prompt injection techniques that play out over the course of many turns. So a simple safety measure is essentially not allowing your users to talk over 30 turns or 50 turns or something like that. Because if you look at the long tail of conversation turns, many of those are where the bad actors are living, right? So implementing these types of input filters is also super important. Now on the agent side of things, you know, most people already have their APIs secured or implementing some sort of safety filters, which is super great. But you also have to think about the return journey. So once the response has actually been generated from the agent and you're about to send this back over to the user, what types of things are you doing to, you know, kind of protect that payload coming back? 
A lot of times it's thinking about things like, do I need to add error handling or retries? Uh, does your LLM API sometimes give you a 500 error? Uh, so being able to like do those types of things, controlled generation, JSON outputs, that's all super important to you know, generating like a really safe solution. The other thing that we found that users often overlooked is this concept of caching, right? So I think that there's a propensity for developers to always want to build the latest and greatest system, use the coolest technology, but if we kind of take a step back at the end of the day, the only thing that matters when you're putting these systems into production is the outcome that they achieve, right? It doesn't matter that they achieved that outcome with the latest, you know, top of the line model. It just matters that they achieved a high quality outcome. And maybe that high quality outcome comes from caching responses. And so you can completely bypass your agentic system by simply knowing that you're going to have like the same query over and over and over again cache the response to that query and send it back to the user. You don't even have to you know, involve your, your LLM at all or your agent system. You save money from tokens and, and you get a lot of speed back as well. So these are just little things to kind of think about as you're building your agentic system and putting it out in production. And the last piece is really kind of thinking about you know, feeding these signals uh, back into your data analyst teams, your data science teams and things like that to be able to do things like, you know, you know take a look at analytics. What are people talking about? And then using those signals to kind of inform how you're updating your prompts, how you're updating your input filters or your output filters, all of the different things that kind of come into play with that. So a lot around safety, a lot around creating this kind of type of layer defense. So think about this as you're putting your agents in, into production. Okay. Uh, last one that we're going to touch on today is evaluations or evals. So you might be thinking like, Patrick, what are evaluations? Why do I need them? Uh, the one thing I would say is if you're building agentic systems, uh, the, the number one thing that you could do is just implement evaluations. If you don't do anything else, implement evaluations because it really helps you provide a sense of measurement and sort of like gives you a barometer for how well your agents are doing in production. So again, evaluations, just simply a process to measure the performance of your agent and identify you know losses and areas of improvement for your agent so imagine a scenario that goes something like this we've probably all already gone through this you build a new agent framework right and or a new agent and you launch that thing out into production everyone's high-fiving and patting themselves on the back we did a really great job our agents out in prod awesome right and then you go to release your next feature that's going to be attached to that agent Maybe you're adding a new tool call, a connection to a database, you change your prompt up a little bit, but all of a sudden, all of your users are coming back and saying like, hey, this thing is garbage now. It's not responding correctly. It's hallucinating. There's all these things that are going on. And you and your team are kind of sitting there going like, what, what's going on, right? Like, it, it, you know, you're starting to look at like kind of manual, um, you know, basically inspecting manually every single response that's coming back from the agent. So, you know, in my base agent, the responses were coming back like this, but in my, you know, updated feature agent, my responses are coming back like this. Like, why is this happening? You might feel a little bit like uh, our friend, Mr. Vincent Vega here, you know, just kind of wondering like, what is going on? How do I solve for this? Uh, and why am I having to do all this stuff manually? And luckily for you, there's a lot of really amazing uh, frameworks out there that help you do evaluations of your agent systems, your RAG systems, your LLM systems, all of the above. They all really start with this concept called a golden data set. Some people also call these expectations. It's all really the same kind of stuff. Uh, what this really boils down to is essentially saying you need to define what is the ideal scenario for what would happen uh, when someone is interacting with your agent. So when a user says this, the agent should say this. When a user responds with this, the agent should call a tool with these inputs, and then it should say this. So you're defining these expectations. And then what this allows you to do is take those expectations and compare them against your agent responses, like the things that are actually happening at runtime, at inference time. And then you can score those against a various set of metrics, again, like semantic similarity, tool calling, coherence, fluency, things like that. Then as you iterate on your agent, your expectations stay mostly static and you're able to see changes or variations in what's happening as you're deploying your changes over time. So you might see, oh, you know, my tool calling is actually suffering and that is causing my semantic similarity and my agent responses to also suffer. This is why people, you know, our users are not happy with the particular system that's going on. So again, evaluation is just a way to kind of measure what's going on in your agentic system. 
Now, to give you one more real world scenario of something that we see all the time with our, with our customers and our partners is essentially evals around multi-stage RAG pipelines. Uh, so I'm sure all of us have built something like this before. Essentially, uh, imagine where you have a user query that comes into a system and you have a model that does maybe a query rewrite on that input query to fix spell corrections or you know, things like that. Then that query goes into a retrieval system in the middle, vector database, fetching all these different pieces of information. And then at the end, you take that query and all of the retrieved information, you send it to a model again to do a summarization and you get some result from it. So you're evaluating the outside of this pipeline essentially, and you're looking at it and you're saying like, hey, cool, we're getting a really great score here. And then someone says, hey, Patrick, you can actually improve this score if you use a re-ranker in the middle. So then you implement re-ranking in the middle and you see that your score is going up and you're like, hey, everything is going great. And then let's say uh, your vendor comes back to you and says, hey, we just launched this brand new model. It's the best thing since sliced bread. You've got to put it in everywhere in your systems because um, it's just we just think it's better than everything that you've built before, right? So you say, okay, cool, I'll try your new model. You throw that new model into production and then what happens? All of a sudden your eval pipeline is saying like, hey, things are suffering. Uh, your responses are coming back really bad. But the interesting thing is you don't really know why that's happening, you know, because you're using that model everywhere. Is it, you know, the fact that the query rewrite is suffering or is it the summarization that's suffering or is it the re-ranking that's suffering? You don't really know what's going on because you're only evaling the outside of that pipeline. So this is where it's also important to think about evals, not only from an end-to-end -end perspective, but also at every stage of the pipeline. So that means you know, performing evaluations on the query write itself and also on the retrieval and also on the summarization. Because essentially this allows you to start to kind of suss out what is happening at each stage and identify like, oh, actually the largest losses that we're seeing are happening inside of the summarization stage. And so we could just swap that back with the previous model. We'll have two models out in production and that will give us like the highest quality results. So again, the takeaway here with evals is if you're not doing anything else, you absolutely have to be doing evals on your agents in production so that you can understand what's going on at each stage of the way. So uh, if you're looking for sort of like a follow up, leave behind, uh, take a screenshot of this, capture it with your phone. This will take you to one of our open source repos where we have a ton of notebooks and code around how to run evaluations uh, with the Vertex SDK, uh, rapid eval SDK model. Um, you can do this with a lot of other frameworks as well. Again, it doesn't really matter to me. What's important is that you're actually doing evals on your production agents uh, and just understanding how to use some of these frameworks. Um, cool. All right, wrapping everything up and then kind of coming back around to Q&A as we have time. Remember, you know, the, the lessons learned here are essentially, you know, after working with developers like yourself, after working with partners and customers and seeing all the things that people are trying, these were the most common things that we found are the most impactful at building high quality agents in production. So like using some sort of meta prompting techniques or prompt optimization techniques, implementing various stages of safety and guardrails and error handling. And then absolutely every single engagement that we worked on had some form of evaluations in there. Without evaluations, there's really no way for you to tell what's actually going on in your system or, or how well it's working. So. With that, I will bring Skylar back on and we'll, I guess we'll jump over to the Q&A. Um, we can kind of go from there. I'll leave this up if you want to yeah. connect with me as well. Awesome, thank you so much. There's a few uh, questions in the chat. We'll just uh, jump through them. Um, first question, when will you plan to release the Vertex AI Agents API to use the most powerful Gemini models to build assistance? Yeah, so that, uh, I, I can't particularly give you the answer to that because a lot of these things are kind of still in preview. So uh, I unfortunately can't give you the timelines for when those things will be released, but they are they are being worked on. And so, um, you know, today, if you're looking for something that is already like a GA product where you can build agents, we have uh, the conversational agents platform. This was previously known as Dialogflow CX. Uh, the Dialogflow CX platform, conversational agents platform, has a full, you know, functioning API to it. So you can build all of these agent experiences via the API. You don't have to go to the UI. Uh, one of the open source libraries that I manage called Scrappy is actually a, a wrapper around this. And so, you know, I guess, you know, shameless plug there, like try out Scrappy to build agents. It's really, really fast to build agents. Uh, you have access to all, all of the latest models uh, in that framework as well. Awesome. 
how do you think about managing versions of agents? Yeah, this is a really interesting one. It comes up all the time. So, you know, the for me, I think the, the easiest way that we found to manage versions of agents are to sort of break up the agent into all of its individual components uh, and think of it all as code. You know, so we the way we manage agents internally uh, is basically pushing all of the, you know, all of the prompts, all of the functions, all of the tools, everything into Git repos. Uh, and essentially you treat you treat everything as code, right? And so that even means like the prompts themselves. And so you're looking at like, what are the diffs between these prompts? Do we need to roll back to, you know, you know pr uh, previous commits and things like that? And so th that's honestly the best way to manage uh, versions of agents is kind of treat them the same way that you would in a traditional like software de development lifecycle uh, with CICD. Awesome. We're at time. This is a great presentation. Really loved the, the key takeaways that we had here and uh, thought it was like uh, simply summarized. Um, but yeah, so everybody, uh, he, Patrick has left his info here. So go ahead and connect with him. Um, but yeah, with that, we'll kind of mosey on forward. Thanks for your time, Patrick. Take care. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Skylar.